Last evening, I attended a debate between a uh, Christian and Jewish uh, uh, scholars or uh, teachers. Uh, one, a uh, uh, prominent uh, Christian uh, uh, ev evangelical uh, scholar uh, responsible for writing uh, dozens of books and uh, articles, a hundred articles or so or more. Uh, the Jewish uh, rabbi, a well-known uh, speaker and defender of Judaism, uh, Orthodox Judaism in response to especially evangelical Christian attempts to proselytize Jews. Uh, and so these two speakers were uh, presenting their different perspectives on the question of whether or not Jesus was the promised Jewish Messiah. Instead of looking at all the details of this debate, which would take far too much time to try to sort those out because there were a lot of different things presented, I wouldn't doubt if there were more than a hundred distinct pieces of, of argument that were presented. And so to, to do a thorough job of that uh, examination would be very, very difficult and certainly time consuming. Uh, so instead of spending all of that time, I thought I would focus on what I thought were a couple of the most important issues that arose in the course of, uh, of this debate. Uh, one I dealt with in the prior presentation that had to do with sort of the approach to interpretation of the Old Testament. Uh, Christians interpret the Old Testament in the light of Jesus, in the light of Jesus as the fulfillment of God's revelation of himself. And so in light of the fulfillment, we can then go back and understand uh, what came before it. It's almost like in Jesus we have the answers at the back of the book, and then we're able to go back and work the problem in light of the answer or the solution. Uh, the Jewish uh, speaker's approach was uh, was quite the opposite, that we judge Jesus in light of our interpretation of the Old Testament, which we acquire without any reference to Jesus as the fulfillment of the Old Testament. I wonder out loud if the Jewish speaker is really consistent in doing this with the Old Testament. Uh, does he take the, because he accepts the entirety of the Old Testament, uh, does he allow, for instance, the prophetic writings of the Old Testament to influence his interpretation of the Law of Moses, for instance, the, the first five books of the Old Testament? My guess is the answer is yes. Uh, he allows those texts to have a controlling influence on the way he reads uh, the Law of Moses or whatever. Uh, and so there's a whole lot of interpretation that goes on in this. In the Christian view of things, we use what we call the, um, you know, the analogia fide, the analogy of faith. Uh, because we see in Jesus the fulfillment of, of our hopes and, and our dreams, uh, and, and we see in Jesus the fulfillment of Judaism, uh, we then look back on the Jewish scriptures and see them in light of Jesus as their fulfillment. And they make sense to us in that light. Now, the other issue that I wanted to talk about here is uh, the comments that the rabbi made about the Trinity and the Incarnation. Uh, he rejects the Trinity because he says it's inconsistent with the Old Testament notion of there being only one God. Uh, there's only one God, and then and the Christian belief adds another to, in fact, adds two to the one God, the Father, uh, the God who reveals himself in the Old Testament. Christians have not only the Father, the one God, but they also add the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so he sees this as a fundamental violation of the Old Testament. Furthermore, uh, he considers this very idea that Jesus could be God as a violation of the commandment against having, uh, making idols or having any other beside uh, the one God. He quotes texts of scripture, for example, like uh, in the book of Numbers, it speaks of uh, God is not a man that he should repent. And so he focused on the God is not a man. Uh, and then compares that, of course, to the Incarnation. In the Christian view of things, God becomes a man in Jesus somehow. Uh, and so he quotes that Old Testament scripture, God is not a man. Christians say that the man Jesus is God, uh, and therefore there is a contradiction there. So he rejects this idea of Incarnation, and he rejects this idea of Trinity. And so I thought that I would reflect on that for just a moment. Uh, you know, the... Um, uh, one, of the, one of the interesting things that I noticed as I listened to the rabbi speak uh, was he spoke uh, several times, I thought very passionately, about the idea that God loves us, that God loves you. Uh, he was sort of reaching out to his Jewish uh, brothers and sisters, but also to Christians, and saying that, that the God uh, of the scriptures, the God of the Old Testament, loves you. God loves you. And he said that a number of times. Uh, and I commend that. I think that's a, a fantastic and wonderful way uh, to speak of God as we find him in the Old Testament. He's a God of love who enters into a relationship with the human being. That somehow God, and, and for some reason, God deeply loves us and he loves his creation. What I would suggest is that in Christian theology, we see that idea that God loves in its most 
full and complete flowering. I don't know of another religion besides Christianity that speaks about God's love in such radical terms. Uh, if you want to find a religion that speaks about God as love, as God loving his creation and loving us as human beings, you cannot find, I don't know of any religion, I don't know of any way of thinking that in any way compares to the Christian understanding of God as love. If you look back in, in ancient Greek philosophy, like with Aristotle, for instance, Aristotle's understanding of God, he, he does believe in God. He believes that the, there's a first unmoving cause of all motion. So he sees the world changing about us. He analyzes that, thinks about that, develops an understanding of the changing world. But in the final analysis, Aristotle comes to the conclusion that if there's a world of changing things, and apparently there is because we can look around and see it, there must be some supreme ground, some unmoving cause of this world of motion. Aristotle's ideas were very influential. His understanding of God and his argument for God was very influential in, in uh, Christian history, especially in the Middle Ages when people like St. Thomas Aquinas uh, wrestled with Aristotle's ideas. Uh, people like Moses Maimonides for the Jewish tradition, and then Muslim philosophers like Avicenna and Averroes, all of these were deeply influenced by the thought and the thinking of Aristotle. But one of the problems with Aristotle is that Aristotle's God is uh, all-powerful in the sense that, that he's the ultimate ground and source of all things. He's unchanging, he's eternal, uh, he's infinite mind or thought. But the thing about Aristotle's God is that he's, he's of such a nature, he's a mind that reflects on or thinks on for, forever, thinks on that which is absolutely perfect. And if he thinks about only that which is absolutely perfect, the only thing he can think about is himself. Because I'm not absolutely perfect, and you're not absolutely perfect, and nothing in this world is absolutely perfect. But for Aristotle, God is not thinking about you, and God is not thinking about me, because we're not perfect. We're imperfect beings. So what God thinks about is himself. But because God is the unmoving ground of all motion, everything is attracted to the unmoving source of it or ground of it. Uh, and therefore, God is the cause or the reason why there is any motion or any change in the world about us. But not because God knows the world, but just because things are attracted to God. So like a magnet, you know, when a, a magnet pulls metal to itself. So it is God pulls changing things to his unchanging perfection, and things try to uh, assimilate to it, or they try to become like it uh, in their motions toward it. Now, all of that's not important to, to understand all the details of what I just got through saying. What I do want to emphasize, though, is the idea of God in Aristotle that he is completely turned in upon himself and doesn't think about us or care about us as creatures. But that won't work for Judaism, and it won't work for Christianity, for sure, and it won't work for Islam either. Uh, it won't work for these religions because all of them speak about God revealing himself and caring about his creation. And like the Jewish rabbi said, God loves you, God loves his people, uh, and God reaches out to them. What I would argue is that Christianity takes that one step further. Christianity, growing out of this Jewish experience of a God who loves us, Christianity takes that a step further and says, not only does God love us and want to bring us home to himself, but God wants to prove his love to us to such a degree that he comes down and seizes or, or captures or possesses or envelops or unites himself with a human nature to show how much he loves human beings, he takes human nature and brings it up close to himself in incarnation. The, the matter of Jesus is not the eternal God. God is not made of matter at all. And so when the book of Numbers says God is not a man that he should repent, it's talking about God as he is in his eternal nature. He's unchanging, he's, he's infinite and all of that. But the God who is eternal and unchanging unites himself with through an eternal act of the divine will, through an eternal decision of God. God chooses to act in and through and through personal union with a human nature that is part of the creation, but that becomes the instrument through which God reveals himself. And that's what we call the incarnation. So the incarnation is a radical statement of the love of God. It's a radical statement about how deeply and profoundly God loves human beings. So I would suggest to, the, uh, to those of the Jewish perspective 
perspective, to see Christianity not as somehow compromising the, the uniqueness of God or even the love of God, but instead Christianity is a radical version of the message of God's deep love for us for, as human beings because he so loves us that he comes down to our level and, and embraces us, first of all, by embracing the humanity of Jesus. Uh, that he makes his own in the sense that he personally unites himself with it and acts in and through uh, the historical person of Jesus. Now finally, the last uh, point I'd like to observe is uh, with respect to the mystery of the Trinity itself. And this is just an extension of the observations that I've already made. The mystery of the Trinity is that God is so deeply love, and love at its highest is this act of self-giving. It's giving oneself for another. It's this selflessness. It's this care for the good of the other, not self-centered or selfish-generated uh, uh, acts. But instead, love is going beyond oneself to the other. Christianity so deeply believes that God is love that God from all eternity has been giving himself or has given himself completely and fully. That act of love within God's own self is what we call the mystery of the Trinity. The Father from all eternity pours himself out in love and that which he pours out, that full gift of himself, is in fact the Son who is the eternal recipient within the nature of God, of God's eternal self-giving love. The Holy Spirit is the Father and the Son proceeding outward in shared love from all eternity. Now, I can't go into all of the details of the mystery of the Trinity, but what I would say is this, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit within God, within the one essence of God, are in fact the perfection of love. And as such, they are fundamentally inseparable. You can't take Father, Son, and Holy Spirit apart from each other because what they mean requires reference to the other. What the Son is, is the Father's eternal love poured out completely. What the Holy Spirit is, is the Father and Son in a shared way pouring themselves out in love. And so the mystery of the Trinity is in fact an affirmation of the eternal, inseparable oneness that exists in God. But it's a oneness of love which requires subject-object relationship. It requires personal interrelationship. And so the God that Christians profess is not a God opposed to the one God of the Old Testament, but the one God that we believe in is a God of communal love, not a God of solitariness, that God is alone from all eternity in the sense that there is no internal love, but instead in God there is uh, uh, eternal um, shared love between the, the eternal persons of the Trinity. Uh, again, there's, there's so much to say about that and the time is, is so short, uh, but those are a few of the things that I would uh, raise as issues in this conversation with, uh, with Jewish theology and the Jewish understanding of the nature of God.